Our next speaker is Jess Hoffelder, affiliated with the University of Wisconsin-Madison Population Health Institute, is a spatial data analyst for the data and analytics team within county health rankings and roadmaps. She leads the team's GIS work, including spatial analyses and the creation of static and interactive maps for the county health rankings and roadmaps website. Jess holds a BS in integrative biology from the University of Illinois and a master in public health in environmental and occupational health sciences from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her interests include environmental health and environmental justice and using GIS and interactive maps to communicate data. All right, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, hi everyone, again, my name is Jess. I'm excited to be here to share a little bit more about the work that my program is doing. This presentation will cover how the programming language Python and ArcGIS notebooks were used to simplify and improve the reproducibility of a county health indicator called access to exercise opportunities. I'm first gonna briefly introduce the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program and how access to exercise opportunities is connected to community health before going over the workflow to ho of how to construct the measure and discussing how it was improved. And this presentation would not have been possible without the incredible work of my talented colleagues at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, especially Dr. Ganwa Lu, Dr. Annie Rubel, and Dr. Christine Muganda. Next slide. So County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, or CHRNR, provides data, evidence, guidance, and examples that raise awareness about the many factors that influence health. CHRNR also supports community leaders working to improve health and increase health equity. County Health Rankings is known for translating and communicating complex data and evidence-informed policy into accessible models, reports, and tools that deepen the understanding of what makes communities healthy. CHRNR's work is rooted in, a health, in health equity, the idea that everyone deserves a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Next slide. One key tool, oh, you might need to click one more time. One key tool we use to achieve these goals is our model of health. The County Health Rankings model illustrates a broad vision for health. It shows that policies and programs at the local, state, and federal level shape health factors that in turn influence a community's health outcomes. Health factors represent things that can improve length and quality of life if modified. They are predictors of how healthy our communities can be in the future. And the four health factor areas in the model are health behaviors, clinical care, social and economic factors, and the physical environment. Health outcomes represent how healthy a county is right now. They reflect the physical and mental well-being of residents through measures representing the length and quality of life typically experienced in the county. And there are more than 80 individual measures or indicators included in the model as health factors and health outcomes. And you'll also notice that we take a holistic approach to health. Community health is about so much more than eating well or going to the doctor. Research has shown that socioeconomic factors like income and education, as well as the physical environment, play a significant role in health. And in public health, these are what are often referred to as the social determinants of health. And you might have to click twice. I think the animations didn't fully come off these slides. Yeah, so one more time. So the county health indicator or measure that is a focus of this presentation is called access to exercise opportunities. It's a measure of access and opportunity for members of a community to support their health by engaging in physical activity. And our model of health, access to exercise, is situated within the health behaviors health factor area. And we added this measure to our data set in 2014. Next slide. So access to exercise opportunities is included in our model because the built environment is important for encouraging healthy behaviors like physical activity. Individuals who live closer to sidewalks, parks, and gyms are more likely to exercise. Next slide. And increased physical activity is associated with lower risks of type 2 diabetes, cancer, stroke, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and premature, mort premature mortality independent of obesity. Next slide. There is extensive research that shows physical activity reduces symptoms of depression, anxiety, and stress. And specifically, access to parks has positive impacts on mental well-being, even if the park is recreation or sport focused instead of nature focused. It is important to understand how much of the population has access to the benefits provided by green space and areas to exercise, because the equitable distribution of these spaces is important for ensuring health equity and environmental justice. Next slide. 
The access to exercise measure is the percentage of the resident population in a county with adequate access to locations for physical activity. Adequate access is defined as residing within a census block, which are represented by the orange boxes on this slide, where the border of the census block is a half mile or less from a park, one mile or less from a recreational facility in an urban area, and three miles or less from a recreational facility in a rural area. The numerator is the total population living in these census blocks with adequate access, and the denominator is the total county population. And I'll note that this measure does not tell us the reason for low access in a given county, and it's not inclusive of all exercise opportunities within a community. For instance, sidewalks, which serve as locations for running or walking, and schools, which may have gyms open to community members, are not captured in this measure. Additionally, access to parks may be made difficult by entrance location, busy streets, or complex street designs. Parks and recreational facilities may have varying amenities, and there are fees associated with access to some recreational facilities. Next slide. I'm now going to go over the construction of the access to exercise measure and how Python and ArcGIS notebooks were used to mitigate the risks of the original manual point and click workflow. Python is a general purpose programming language that can be used for data analysis and task automation, and ArcGIS Notebooks provides a Jupyter Notebook experience and allows users to create documents that contain live Python code and narrative text. The construction of this measure is complex, and it used to take several weeks to complete. It has five input data sets, which I'll show on the next slide, and requires the use of multiple ArcGIS tools. One risk year to year was that different tool parameters might have been used for something like the buffer tool in ArcGIS Pro, and this made the measure difficult to reproduce. Additionally, the measure was constructed using ArcGIS Pro and SAS, and exporting data from Pro and importing into SAS added a lot of time to the process. And further, the use of a point and click approach in ArcGIS Pro left room for human error when interacting with the geoprocessing tool interfaces, it meant that collaboration was limited to teammates with GIS software experience. Next slide. These are the five input data sets used in the construction of the measure. USA Parks from the ArcGIS Living Atlas, recreational facility locations with the SIC codes shown on the slide from the ArcGIS Business Analyst, YMCA facility locations provided by the YMCA, and census urban areas and blocks from the census tiger line shapefiles. The ArcGIS business analyst and census block data sets in particular are very large. This past year, there were more than 80,000 records in the business analyst recreational facility data that we pulled, and there are more than 8 million census blocks from the 2020 decennial census. Next slide. So this is a diagram of the workflow that was previously used, and there's no need to try to read everything on the slide. The purpose is just to show that the measure is complex to construct. Next slide. So this portion of the workflow was completed in ArcGIS Pro with a point and click approach in the past. Some key steps that are important for understanding the construction of the measure and some of the weaknesses of the past approach are as follows. One, the creation of the buffers around the parks, YMCAs, and business analyst recreational facilities. For the recreational facilities, the size of the buffer depends on the facility's urban or rural status. And two, once the buffers are created around the parks and recreational facilities, they're all merged and dissolved together into one large multi-part polygon, which I'll refer to as the all parks and rec facilities polygon. And as I mentioned earlier, the buffer tool is one where all of the parameters that were entered into the tool year to year weren't documented, and this made it difficult to duplicate the workflow and get the same exact results. Next slide. This image is centered on Wisconsin, and it shows what the buffered parks and recreational facilities look like. Um, in ArcGIS Pro, there are two possible method parameters when using the buffer tool, planar and geodesic. And the default parameter is planar. And with that method parameter, the tool will create Euclidean buffers if your input data sets are in projected coordinate systems, and geodesic buffers if the input data sets are in geographic coordinate systems, so not projected, and then if the user specifies a buffer distance in linear units, which we do. In the past, some of the input data sets for this workflow were projected and some weren't. Um, and without knowing for sure which method parameter was used by the tool, this could have resulted in a mix of Euclidean and geodesic buffers being created and then merged and dissolved together. So one big advantage of the Python code in ArcGIS notebooks was that the parameters used in all of the geoprocessing tools were typed out in the code 
And markdown can be used in the notebook to make it to document the rationale behind which parameters were used and also to include links to the ArcGIS Pro tool documentation. Next slide. This is a section of the ArcGIS notebook that shows the notes and links to external documentation that be could that could be included alongside the Python code. Next slide. Going back to the key steps in the workflow, the third step to note is that the census blocks in each state are intersected with the all parks and rec facilities polygon, and the population in the blocks that intersect with the polygon is the population that has access to exercise opportunities. The intersect tool is run 51 times because the census block files for some states are so large that they'll run for several hours, especially for like California or Texas. And because of how time consuming the step is, both to re-enter the parameters in the tool interface and to let the tool run, this is one of the reasons um, why the workflow is so long in the past. This step in particular would be spread over multiple days. So the automation of this step with Python code was one of the biggest reasons so much time was saved in the updated workflow. Next slide. To illustrate what the output of the intersect step looks like, this image is centered on Wisconsin, and it shows the census blocks that intersect with the buffered areas around parks and recreational facilities. Next slide. Finally, in the past workflow, the attribute tables of the outputs from the intersect tool, um, which the outputs were shown on the previous slide, were exported from ArcGIS Pro and the final aggregation of the data to the county level. And the calculation of the final measure, the access to exercise opportunities was done in SAS. Next slide. Python and ArcGIS notebooks allowed the workflow to be completed almost entirely in ArcGIS Pro, as is shown in this diagram of the updated workflow. Again, there's no need to focus on reading the whole slide. This emphasizes that this um, diagram just emphasizes more steps were completed in ArcGIS Pro and the workflow was streamlined a little bit more. Box one shows that the aggregation to the county level of the population with access to exercise and the total population was done with the ArcGIS Pro statistics tool. Box two shows that the final measure, the percent of the county living in a census block with access to exercise opportunities was calculated using the calculate field tool. And box three shows that the YMCAs and business analyst recreational facilities were merged into one set of features before assigning urban and rural status, which meant that the buffer tool was only run three times instead of five. Next slide. Beyond limiting the potential for human error and streamlining the workflow, one of my favorite advantages provided by the use of Python and notebooks was the ability to collaborate more easily with my teammates. I'm currently the only member of our team that has a lot of experience using GIS software, but I have another teammate, Dr. Granwa Liu, with extensive experience in writing Python code, who is able to help me improve the efficiency of the code. As I mentioned earlier, there are tools in the workflow, like the intersect tool, that need to be run 51 times to avoid extremely long processing times and potential software freezes. I wanted to avoid writing 51 lines of code, for all of the tools that needed to be run this many times, but I'm still at the beginning of learning Python, and so I didn't know how to do this. But I was able to share the code that I had written so far with Ganwa and links to the tool documentation um, from ArcGIS, and he was able to quickly write the code to loop through running these tools. And the green arrows indicate where we wrote loops in the code. Next slide. All I had to do was copy and paste the code that he wrote into my ArcGIS notebook and the problem was solved. And the image on this slide is an example of the code that was written by Ganwa to loop through using the intersect tool. Next slide. And this is the code that was used to create the data frame that is referenced um, in the parameters for the intersect tool. So the data frame had the names and the input and output feature of the input and output feature classes so that as the code looped through running the intersect tool, each time a different input feature class and output feature class name was used. Next slide. So to summarize, using the Python coding language in ArcGIS notebooks provided many advantages for the workflow to construct the access to exercise opportunities measure. Python made the parameters used within each tool visible and ArcGIS notebooks allowed for detailed documentation to be included. The workflow can now be completed in a single software, combining steps previously com completed in ArcGIS Pro and SAS. The use of Python led to increased collaboration with teammates without GIS experience and resulted in a more succinct and efficient code. And the automation of the workflow drastically cut down on the time needed to construct this measure. As I mentioned earlier, the construction of this indicator used to take several weeks, but this Python code can be run in one day. 
Overall, Python and ArcGIS notebooks allowed us to limit human error in this workflow and improve its reproducibility. Next slide. In the future, I think this could be used to create other proximity-based county health indicators, such as access to libraries or community centers. Um, and on the flip side, I think it could also be modified to capture proximity to places that negatively impact community health, such as environmental hazards, or to identify under-resourced areas like maternal health care deserts. This was also a good proof of concept for my program that code can be written for GIS-based analyses. And I think this will lead to more opportunities to use GIS analytical tools to create new county health indicators to be included in our model of community health. Next slide. I want to give a huge thanks again to Dr. Ganwalu for helping me write the Python code for this workflow and Dr. Annie Rubel for creating the methodology used to construct the measure. And special thanks as well to Dr. Christine Muganda and all the county health rankings and roadmaps team members that supported this project. Support for county health rankings and roadmaps is provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And then if you can just advance two slides. Um, these are the ways that you can stay connected with county health rankings and roadmaps. We welcome requests for continued conversation, including data and code sharing, and those can be directed through the contact us form on our website. And I also included a link to the Living Atlas, where if you search county health rankings, you can find our data in the ArcGIS Living Atlas. Thank you.